Was that exciting? We've been talking about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, about being saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. Amen? So today's sermon title is Saved from Sin for a Holy Life. Nobody ever dismissed the children for children's church, I see. That was uh, going to happen while I was going to. So children at this time are dismissed for children's church. Thanks for the wave, Roger and Shannon. That was awesome. The title of the sermon today, Saved from Sin for a Holy Life. I've been thinking about that title, and I wonder how does that title strike you? How does it hit you? I would think there are probably some folks listening either here or online that are kind of hesitant to even listen further. Because the concept of sin, when they think of the word of sin, they think of an angry finger pointing at them saying, you're a sinner. And if they think of a holy life, they think of holier than thou, judgmental life. And so the the idea of walking away from sin and embracing the life of a saint and holiness seems to them something they're not interested in. Maybe they heard the old Billy Joel song, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. Some say they're better, but I say they ain't. And maybe that's you. And if it is, I hope you'll listen and be willing to consider some different understandings of what it is to walk away from sin and walk into a life of joyful holiness by God's grace. For, for others, the title hits you and you say, I don't think it's needed. I mean, we're all sinners, yeah. We're basically pretty good people, but we're sinners, but it isn't a big deal. You just, you, you say a little prayer. Maybe you go to church, maybe you get baptized. You, you you get your get out of hell free card. I mean, it's all cool. It doesn't really matter. If that's you, I hope again that you'll listen more carefully to what the scripture says about sin and holiness. Maybe you're here. And when when the title goes saved from sin to live a holy life, part of you sits forward in the chair and wants to listen. Because you've laid at bed, you've laid in your bed at night, and over and over and over again, you've played back a moment in your past that you said something or you did something that you cannot believe you did. Maybe it's something that's become a regular pattern You've told yourself a thousand times, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to go to that website. I'm not going to talk to people that way. I'm not going to do that. And so the idea that there might be a way out is something worth listening to. I would suggest to you that when Jesus walked this earth, there was a reason that the prostitutes and sinners came to him, because he offered forgiveness. But more than just forgiveness, he offered a chance for repentance. Now, we have to redefine or re-understand the word repentance. You go out and you ask, what does repentance mean? Again, somebody see somebody on the street corner. I met one of these guys one time who told me I was going to hell because I was having a good time, and I guess God didn't like that. He got really upset when he tried to tell me what he thought Jesus would be doing, and it wasn't doing what I was doing. And I said, well, where, where was Jesus' first miracle, which, of course, was the wedding of Canaan, when he turned water to wine, and he didn't like that, so he got even more sure that I was going to hell. 
Now, here's the great news. He doesn't get to determine if I go to hell. But he used that word repentance as I was standing there as a weapon to try to beat people with. You need to repent. If his life was a holy life, it didn't look very attractive. He, he looked like it had been a long time since he'd unfurled his face. And I'm not trying to be judgmental. I hope that wasn't. But you see, repentance is actually something that's wonderful. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Repentance, the ability to repent, the, the ability to have a change of mind that leads to a change of direction with life, that's beautiful, right? That we're not labeled by what we do. We're not labeled by past activity, whatever activity. We're not labeled by past activity or behavior. Our identity can be found in Christ. We can find a new start in Christ. Praise the Lord. The big lie of Satan is to try to get people to identify with their behavior instead of find their identity in Christ. Repentance is that change of mind that leads to a change of direction. It's remorse in itself is, is no good to do that. You can feel bad, that's okay, but remorse is only good, regret is only good if it leads us to repentance. Otherwise, we just lay around being miserable, right? Satan wants us to get, there's spiritual forces in our own flesh that wants to get us wasting our time trying to undo the past instead of finding grace and moving forward into the future. You see, when we try to control what we can't control, the past, we stop doing what we're called to do in this moment and the future moments. Amen? Now, when I'm driving down the road, and I don't know who programmed my map system, and I won't say which one I use, but every once in a while, it obviously does not understand Seattle traffic. Anybody with me here? Where all of a sudden it says, at the next light, make a right. I'm all the way over in the left lane. And the people next to me don't think they're going to let me go all the way over to the right lane, right? And so, what happens? You know what happens. I can't get over. And pretty soon it says, say it with me, rerouting. Rerouting. Aren't you glad that God has a rerouting for our lives? That there's a chance to turn around, have a repentance? You know, remorse without repentance is just realizing you're going the wrong direction and parking your car. But that's not what the car's meant to do. <laughs> just sitting around and feeling miserable about what you did in the past isn't going to get you where God's called you to get. In fact, some people, I think, stop going to church because if all the church does is tell you you're messing up your life, you're messing up. Here's what you're supposed to do. You're not doing it. You're messing up. So what hope is there for you? You go, well, I can, I can sit at home and have a decent breakfast and sleep in and, and tell you I'm messing up places. That's not any rocket science. But if what the church does is connect you to a hope, a grace that, that has the power as a, to, to, to not only forgive you, but to put you on a road of living differently. Now, we say often here, we have been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved by grace and for his glory. Amen. So I'm going to reread this passage, and we spent a long time on this passage, and we're going to be spending more weeks here. He says this, as Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to the church in Ephesus, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. You were what? As my friends, some, some other nations would say, I'm going to need a little help here, guys. A little amen, okay? Amen, praise the Lord. Yeah. We were dead. Did dead people save themselves? I used to be a first responder when, when somebody's in cardiac arrest. We never said, hey, use a defibrillator. Why don't you hook that up on yourself? Do a little CPR on yourself. You're going to be okay. We needed help, big help, right? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Who once walked? All. He's saying everybody is sinner, right? 
following the course of this world. That means if you go for popularity in this world, you're not going to make the decisions that God would want you to make. Agreed? Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So in upcoming weeks, I'm going to talk about today about being saved from sin. Next week, I'm going to talk about being saved from the pressures of the world. I'm going to talk about being saved from satanic and demonic forces, what those are, what those aren't. And being to talk about being set free from the wrath of God. But today, I want to talk about these sins. I'll continue to read the verses first, though. Among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh... Listen to me very carefully and understand. The world is trying to lie to you. It's trying to tell you that if you were born with a desire, you have to act on that desire, and that desire defines you. I don't care who you are. That's not true. Amen? I was born with a national, natural desire to want to punch people when they took stuff from me. I'm not kidding. Uh, but that's not Christian. I didn't, take my, I didn't teach my kids to take from each other. I taught them to share. Amen. Chesterton, the old philosopher uh, and theologian, used to say, the only, only thing you needed to prove original sin is one toy and two kids. Among whom we all once walked in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, the flesh, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, mercy is not getting what we deserve, right? Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may, say it with me, say with it. Some of you guys know that, that I get the opportunity to go to churches. I've been in ministry for over 30 years. You know what divides churches most? Is arrogance. Churches don't divide over the color of the carpet. They divide over who gets to choose the color of carpet. What he's saying is, we ought to be telling the world the truth about sin and how bad it is and, and how great grace is, but we ought to be doing it humbly and not boasting because we didn't get ourselves saved. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For many years, I had this experience, and maybe you've had it, where it seemed like people were telling me in the church not to sin, but they failed to tell me what I was supposed to be doing. See, we're both sinners by nature and by choice. We also commit sins of what theologians call commission and omission. Sometimes we sin by doing something we shouldn't, Sometimes we sin by not doing something we should. Right? Now, I'm going to read one more verse, and then I'm going to draw some points out here. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, catch it there, holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. So he's writing to Christians, folks who put their faith in Christ, and he's saying you were chosen by God, predestined to live differently. Amen? And if you're here and you've never put your faith in Christ, you've never had your eyes open into the grace that he offers, we're praying that your eyes will be open and you will embrace Christ as your Savior. Amen? Here's what I drew out of this passage. And I encourage people to go to the website. Forced before you go to the website, anything I say that's not in accordance with the Scripture doesn't really matter. It's what the Bible says. But I encourage you to read through Ephesians. And we have been spending a lot of time preaching through it and so you can find sermons. We've been in this passage for a little bit here. 
But for today, I wanted to talk about this. Point one, sin is disobedience to God and missing the mark of what life is meant to be. And people say, well, we're all sinners, but we act like sin's no big deal. It is a big deal. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. You see, sin means we're not living. I used to hear all the time, by the way, when I was a kid, that sin is missing the mark. Missing what mark? We need to understand that sin isn't just making a mistake. We're, don't, excuse, don't confuse human limitation with sin. Right? You say, I, I was at a conference and I spoke and there was 200 people there and I couldn't remember everybody's name. Everybody's human. Yeah, but that's not sin. That's just limitation, right? One of the things when I used to coach kids' athletics, I wanted to say to parents, a child needs to understand the difference between doing something wrong and making an error in baseball. Amen? Sin isn't just making a mistake. It's being disobedient to God, and it's missing the mark. What mark? The mark of bringing glory to God in the way you live. How do you bring glory to God? We're created to bring glory to God. Jesus told us in the great command, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We are meant to use our gifts and our talents to love God and to love others, to be a part of the body of Christ, doing good deeds, not to earn God's love, but because we know we are loved by God. Amen? Two. What is the penalty of sin? According to Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, eternal death. So the penalty of sin is eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do you pay for a gift? You don't. You receive it. So you see all the books. I don't know if I announced that, by the way. You can have any of those books. They're gifts. Out of my library and the church library out there, as I'm moving offices and down the hall, I decided it would be a good idea to give a bunch of books away. Well, when I, was, when I was going through my stuff, I have to confess, I found a gift card somebody gave me four years ago. Ever happened to you? See, we need the grace of God to receive the gift of grace he's giving us. Amen. And not trying to earn it. And that's point three. The cure of sin is salvation by grace through faith in Christ. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own. Uh, there's some of you, perhaps you've been Christian so long you forgot how glorious that is. Some people say all religions are basically the same. Most of the religions of the world teach that you have to earn your way to God. Christianity says... God reaches down to you while you're yet sinners, while you're still dead in your trust passes. Four, to live free of sin is to live holy lives filled with passion and purpose. Did you catch that? The reason we want to be set free from sin is not so that we can boast. but so we can live as we were meant to live. Did you catch that? Many of you know that I spent many years going to a jail and doing a Bible study in the jail. I was just locked in the cell with guys. Many of them became friends over the years that I did it. But, but one thing that I would talk about a lot is what is God calling you to? See, the, the question is, why do you want to stop doing that? Right? What happened a lot of folks, what I found is a lot of people were told, you know, methamphetamine is ruining your life. And the guys would go, yeah, but 
Who cares? My life stinks anyway. So we not only had to tell them it's ruining your life, but we had to tell them there's a purpose for your life. And your identity isn't in what your parents did to you or what you did, anything else. Your identity can be found in Jesus Christ. And God has called you and he has a purpose for your life. Amen? One of the young guys that I, I, I talked to many years ago is now a missionary sharing the gospel in Brazil. He had actually said he couldn't receive the gospel because he'd given his soul to the devil. He actually out loud gave an oath that he gave his soul to the devil. And I said, well, the devil doesn't get you. And for two years, we talked about salvation. And he, he got in a program, actually in the Teen Challenge program, and he called me one day and he said, at two years you met with me, Kevin, I don't remember anything you said. That, by the way, is not a great ego booster. <laughs> and I've told this story often because he said this, but I do remember you always ended our conversation with, you can turn your life to Jesus and he'll save you. And he said, I'm just calling to tell you I have done that. Flash forward, now he's working around the world sharing Jesus with folks. Amen? In a couple weeks, I've asked, uh, in one of these weeks, if, if Paul Wilson, some of you know Paul from the church here, will share his story uh, about his faith in the Lord. He has faith in the Lord for, for years, but he said he kind of was moving away from the Lord, and I'm going to let him tell his own story. I had coffee with him this week. And he said he was overwhelmed by the presence of the glory of God, something like that, when he recognized the fact. Paul's here. I told, I'm okay if, telling him. So Paul told me, and this really moved me, buddy. Thanks for coffee. That when you, I'm looking at it, make sure I got it right. When you connect an understanding of repentance and confession with the glory of God's grace, it changes everything. Amen. And now, Paul's looking to go to get some more Bible training and so forth. Can we give a, give a shout out to the Lord? And one of the things that, that I know, I'm going to run out of time. I'm having so much fun up here. Paul said is, the first thing after, like my hands went numb. You were telling me your hands went numb. I just so much sensed the grace and the forgiveness of God. My very hands went numb. And when I got up, I just had to go tell somebody. For some of you who've been around here for a while, for seven years, I've been saying, we've got to share our faith. We've got to share our faith. And people say, well, that's kind of the pastor's job, isn't it? No. People go, man, that guy, he gets paid to be good. The rest of you guys are good for nothing. Just kidding. But the, but the whole point is, people want to see authenticity. God's got a call on your life. Do you understand that? You weren't saved to sit on the sidelines. You weren't saved just to stop doing these things, you were saved to start doing these things. Amen? We love to help people find their purpose and their passion. So to live free of sin is to live holy lives filled with passion and purpose. And then I'm going to make these three points in closing. Christians have been saved from the guilt of sin. Again, I say this every week because repetition could be our friend. The culture that we live in says the biggest problem is I feel guilty. The Bible says, no, the biggest problem is you are guilty. Right? Notice we say things like, I hope that didn't sound prejudiced, instead of, I'm sorry I'm being prejudiced. Right? I hope that didn't sound selfish. How about, I'm sorry that was selfish. We act sometimes like it could just be a slip of tongue because I would never actually have a racist or prejudiced or rude or unkind thought in my. And the Lord says, let's get real. Let's get real. If today I was to show a show of every th on this screen, every thought you've had, every deed you've done, most of us would leave if it wasn't for the grace of God. Right? But here's the good news. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. When we turn to Christ, the guilt is gone. 
there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Amen? doesn't matter what you have. I think sometimes we can't speak on some, certain issues. People should be really careful. I remember... Um, I remember a gal in our church, anytime I mentioned the word abortion, um, she would want, want to bolt out of church. And until the day came, and she goes, you know what? God has forgiven me. Here's a new start. Amen? I don't, I don't, I don't need to uh, get, get angry. Here, here's the thing. Borrowed faith has no power. And borrowed conviction has no power. Somebody else telling you you're doing something wrong, but the Holy Spirit, when you pray about it, what do you think about what you're doing? What do you really think about it? And when we feel bad, we don't need to feel condemnation. Condemnation says, I'm a loser, there's nothing I can do. Conviction says, I've been saved by the grace of God. The guilt is gone. And therefore, I can no longer live like that. Right? My theology professor, David Clark, used to say that before he went to a party when he was a kid, his mom used to get down on one knee like this. He said, David, come here. Very lovingly. She said, that tone seemed a little snippy. I don't think she was snippy. Come here, David. I just want to remind you something. At the party today, don't forget you're a Clark. Right? And David told us in class, this is many years ago, more years ago than I want to admit, that he said, I want you gentlemen and ladies in this room to understand that I want you to see your heavenly father down on one knee with his hands on his shoulder, looking in the eyes and saying, when you go out into the world today, when you go to your job, Remember, you're a Christian. You wear my name. I love you now. Have a good time. Praise the Lord. Point six is Christians are being saved from the power of sin. These points, uh, I, I've going to rephrase them from, well, actually, the exact phrasing from the English, from the English uh, the ESV study Bible. Uh, but Christians are being saved from the power of sin. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. None of us have arrived yet. We're, we're still being saved. We've, we've been declared righteous, but we're in process. Can I get an Amen. And the process is slower than we would like. Every rush hour, I have another sanctification test. Right? Some of you know I have seven kids. I don't normally lead with the fact I'm a Baptist pastor with seven kids. It kind of shuts down conversation pretty quick on any plane. Um, but one thing I, I found out with parenting and also parenting a child with special needs is it revealed some stuff about my life that needs work. Right? One thing that happens in, in marriage, and not everybody's called to get married, and I know that, and also can happen in close friendship, is you get a mirror that kind of reflects back some stuff. You go, ah, I probably should not do that, right? And here's, here's the good thing. It isn't that God says, you're saved. Good luck keeping yourself saved. The grace that pardons is there to help transform and will transform. Can I get an amen? I have um, a verse from Hebrews 12, 5 through 9, and I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm reading it. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And in, in that period of time when they said sons, they meant sons and daughters, I believe. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord dis disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father's spirits and live? Now, I know some of you had bad experiences with your father. I get that. 
But a good father lovingly disciplines his children. Amen? And so the fact that my, I've been set free from the guilt of sin does not mean that God doesn't still discipline. Amen? There's consequences to what I do. Even as a Christian, if I decide to get drunk and run over somebody in my car, they're going to be dead, and I'm going to go to jail. I can't go, well, Jesus forgave me. It's fine. Am I making sense? And so God loves us, and he, he puts some things. This was really important when I did jail ministry, to say it doesn't mean that God hasn't forgiven you that you have to serve your sentence. Amen? It doesn't, you can get forgiveness from God. That doesn't mean necessarily you're going to get your family back. Is that true? So, but God is there, and he's going to help us through it. I'm out of time, but I wanted to tell, I wanted to tell you how often I've seen that. That when you give loving discipline, it really works in lives. Amen? I can remember telling so many folks over the years of ministry, you're going to hear something maybe nobody told you, is I love you and there's nothing that's going to change my love for you. One, and two, what you did is totally, there's no excuse for it. Absolutely no excuse. The excuses you're giving me won't work. Just like my excuses don't work, but you don't need those excuses. Take the grace of God, and let's live differently by his grace. Let's live as Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, Not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've already made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15.10 But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's not fearing losing his salvation. What he's saying is work it out. By God's grace. Amen? I got a little concerned. I know I'm going a little long, but I get really excited when I have baptism. I got a little upset one time when one of the sheriffs in town when I was doing jail Bible study said, yeah, you should go see Pastor Kevin. He's not too religious or spiritual or anything. What are you talking about? So I went and I talked to him about it. He goes, well, you don't just give them pie in the sky stuff. You give them stuff that actually changes their life. And I get to share the gospel. You know what I, what I tell them is the gospel. That's what I give them. I, 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 I talk about real repentance. I talk about not only turning from your sins, but finding the purpose that God has in your life. You see, there's lots of people who are letting their potential rot away. And God has a purpose for them. But they've defined themselves in some way different than God has defined them. Like my friend who said because he's given, because he'd been abused as a child and because he'd been angry at God and because he gave his life to Satan that he could never come to Christ and be a Christian. That was a lie that was holding him back for years and now he's bringing the gospel to the nations. Don't let anybody else define you. Let God define you. Amen. So we have been saved from the guilt of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. And my last point today is Christians will be saved from the presence of sin. Acts 15, 11. But we believe that we will be saved through grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. That's not just the individual. That's all of us, both individually and corporately. Who, who are claimed Christ, are going to be made complete. Praise the Lord. You see, if you want to embrace the gospel, you want to, I'm going to have, Jeff, you can come. You're not just trying to get free of the consequences of sin. You're not just trying to get to a place where you can say, I'm holier than you, I, I, I don't do this, 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 this. You're trying to get to a point where you live out of love for God and love for others. And you set your sins aside by his grace and for his glory. Amen? And you feel the passion of God in what you do.
when you're heading the wrong direction, you just pull over your car and park it. You listen to the rerouting and you go where you're called to go. Some of you have been on the wrong road. But that's not your identity. Today's the day you could just say, Jesus, I want your forgiveness. I want your grace. I want to be made new. Maybe you're here and you say, well, I did that as a kid. Maybe you're like Paul's story. You say, yeah, I've, I've known Jesus for a lot of years, but I started doing some stuff. And I, I, I'm not living with the power that God has given me in regard to some stuff. And I'm tired of trying to measure up and I'm trying to, I'm tired of trying to show off to people or pretend to be something I'm not. Today, I'm all yours. I'm all yours, Lord. I'll go where you say to go. I'll, I'll do what you say to do. I'm all yours. And then one day, your life will come near an end. It'll be like my good friend I've told you about, Rich Feaster, who last week went to be with the Lord after struggling with cancer. And he said, I have no fear of death because I know my Savior awaits. Someday we'll all gather together in a new heaven and in a new earth. There'll be no more pain, no more heartache. Praise the Lord. I hope you will think about this and you'll fill out your connection cards and you'll talk to us. We've been praying for seven years that I've been here for revival. To, to, to set ourselves free. I tell you, I've learned a lot in the last seven years. A lot of stuff I thought I was further along with than I was. God said, you got to work on that, but I'm going to help you. You spend some time praying to the Lord right now, and Jeff's going to lead us in a song. You can go ahead and stand.